Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons. This time, we're going to talk about one of the building blocks of containers and all this wonderful cloud native stuff. Um, um, my guest today is Mark Lamarine, a good friend of mine and a longtime Red Hatter. Um, and he's going to really go through um, the underpinnings of everything and give us an inter inter introduction to container hosts. So, Mark, take it away. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Mark Lamarine, just so people know, I, uh, I've been working at Red Hat for seven years and I've worked on OpenShift 1 and OpenShift 2 and I've been working on OpenStack as well. Um, but one of the things that has intrigued me uh, recently is the, the container hosts, um, both CoreOS and Atomic host. Um, and it occurred to me in working and in, in viewing the environment that um, the container hosts themselves and that the, the application, the, the system administration layer between the operating system and uh, the containers and the orchestration uh, seem to be getting less attention than I thought maybe it deserved. And the, this presentation is a result of that. Um, this is a, actually a condensed version of a presentation I gave at the LISA conference um, about a week ago. And uh, that was a three hour tutorial. Um, so I think for half an hour we could just cover the pieces, but this talk contains references to the original material I had for that uh, for that tutorial as well. Um, and if people have questions uh, or if people want to follow up, uh, there are links and references here to the to that material. Um, right. Go forward. Be in the right window. Um, this is just so you can see the, the slides and code samples from that LISA presentation are here. I'll also make a, a copy of the slides that I'm using for this uh, available, and Diana's going to make the recording available as well. Um, I want to go back to kind of the beginning. Again, I'm talking about container hosts, and I'll need to talk about what a container host is, but first I want to kind of revisit what our uh, our conventional view of um, of a Linux host or of a of a server is, and the fact that it, it it is the way it is because of history. It was built up uh, over time to serve our needs. And um, if you're old like me, you remember things like uh, recompiling your your kernel so that you could add a tape drive. Um, you can remember. Uh, going and getting your compiler on uh, on tape and building it three times to produce with itself to verify that it still works. Um, when we first started with these, we didn't have packages. We didn't have. We were still learning. We were we were learning from the very beginning, and we were doing things like putting our software in user local because we didn't have any way to keep it separate. Um, we had kind of standard ways of building software. We'd grab a tarball from somewhere and there would be a file or a script in there called configure and we'd run configure, make, make, install. Um, I remember a time when I thought shared libraries were evil because I was used to uh, old systems, uh, Windows 95 and 98 that had uh, Windows DLLs and the biggest complaint Microsoft had for service was people who were editing the configuration files and messing with the DLLs and um, they literally created the registry to, to counter that. Um, so I'm coming from the, the old days, um, but this is what we started with, and we created things to counter that. We created packages, uh, we created uh, package repositories, um, and we came up with a set of conventions for how to manage uh, systems for our users. Now, the, the conventional host that we're used to seeing um, is kind of built up of control domains and, and different uh, layers of software. And if this looks like the ISO uh, layers, ah, that's not what you need to see. Um, if this looks like the layer related, at the bottom you have uh, the operating the operations layers, which are the basis for uh, for work, and at the top you have your applications, and then there's some stuff in the middle. Um, now these layers impose a series of dependencies. Each layer depends on the layer beneath it, 
uh, to do its job. And each layer from the bottom up provides an interface that has to be stable so that the next layer up can trust it. Um, if we start at the bottom, the operating system is managed by an ops team. Um, they install the kernel, they install the operating environment. It's generally managed by package management, or most of us are going to be familiar with YUM or apt. Um, and these are the layers that are fairly static. These people tend to, people managing this tend to be very conservative. Uh, they get blamed if the machine goes down for whatever reason. Um, or even through whatever interpretation. So they tend to be pretty uh, focused on stability and on, on conservative updates. Um, at the top layer, we have our applications developers. These are people who, uh, they're moving fairly quickly, relatively quickly. They want to do things um, with, the, they want to use the most up-to-date software. They want to use the most up-to-date libraries. They're constantly changing the, their business logic and their business data to meet new demands. Um, and they have a very dynamic update schedule. These people are really moving quickly and they, they appreciate the stability from below, but there are times when there are issues. Now in the middle layer, this is where things get kind of interesting. In the ideal situation, this is controlled by the ops team and they, they maintain it in the same way that they maintain their other layers um, because these are the pieces that the, the apps people use. They're, if they are moved too quickly, uh, the, apps, the apps layers can break and the apps people will be upset. Um, and on the other hand, if they, if they contain security flaws or something like that, then uh, the, the operating system people will get blamed for it. And so they want to do the updates in lockstep with uh, with security updates. Um, but these two things cause some conflict. This is more the reality of what you see um, in that middle layer. You see the ops people who control some app libraries, and then you're going to find the, the apps people say, oh, I can't wait for whatever it is. I need the next version of my Ruby library. And so they start. Um, taking responsibility for those things, but they also, and they take control. Um, and you get kind of a mixed bag in this layer of pieces that are run in system space and pieces that are maintained in user space. It means too that you've got new software management systems because the apps people at the top are maintaining their code. Uh, the operating system people at the bottom are maintaining their code a different way. And then there's a conflict in the middle over who owns those middle pieces and who's responsible for keeping them up to date and keeping them secure and stable. So to come back, the, the things that characterize our traditional hosts are a fairly tight coupling between the OS and the app. Um, you know, and you, you ask some questions, you know, the ops team owns the binaries and libraries, but why does the ops team care which version of Apache or which version of Ruby the, the developers are using. Um, and so these groups vie for control. Who's got what version of a library? Um, the scripting libraries are provided by the ops team, but they only generally provide one version or maybe two if, for uh, systems that allow that. And so the users have created user space uh, library management systems um, like JAM and PIP and NPM, uh, which can be in conflict with the system ones. And then when something goes wrong, it becomes difficult to say, you know, who's responsible for uh, the, the, for the layer that you're working with. Um, one of the things about scripting libraries and user space is that it, it, it actually kind of discourages interface stability. Um, the users are able to make updates whenever they want. And then the developers of those libraries also seem to be less concerned about um, interface stability. They just keep adding new features because they're using the same mindset. Um, there are some alternatives to this user space management. Um, there's uh, software collections, which are something that are provided as packages, which allow you to run different environments of say Ruby or, or Rails or various other tools um, where the ops people can install a set of packages for a specific version, and then the users can uh, can enter an environment 
for the appropriate version. But this is really just putting off the problem. It's, it's actually doing kind of a combinatorial explosion. Um, in the case of the where you just install everything, one of the things about, about current hosts is that we just generally install everything in uh, system space because some user is going to need it. So if you look at the system libraries for something like Python or, or Perl or, or Ruby, you're going to find that there are lots and lots of libraries there that, that the two or three applications running on a typical host probably never use, and so they never need to be there. Um, another important characteristic of conventional hosts right now is that when you do updates, even with a package system, once you do the update, it's very difficult to roll back. Um, and so uh, you pretty much have to, to very carefully roll forward. And we come up with these conventions of rolling forward only a small piece of the ops team will roll forward their operating system and then wait, wait to see if their, uh, if their services break. And then when we're satisfied with that for a week or so, we'll roll it forward to a slightly larger dev space where those people can do their work. Um, and then the final thing we'll do is roll it all out to um, to our production environments. Um, but the reason we have to be careful in this way is that there's no way to go back. There's no good, reliable way of rolling back the operating system layers. So one potential solution for this is uh, something that we're calling container hosts. Um, and I'm using this as a, a broad term. I'm going to cover two of the varieties of container hosts right now, which are both popular and uh, uh, well-maintained. Um, and I'm familiar with them. There are others that I'm less familiar with, and I can't speak to them. Just for, for background, the, there's a history of trying to create some hosts that have uh, different characteristics from the container, from the traditional hosts. Um, the earliest ones were embedded systems, uh, PSOS, Wind River, and there was a third one whose name I can't remember. Um, the idea of these was that you would have a, a very small operating system that would run in some kind of very limited hardware, and you'd build your application tightly bound to that environment, and then and he dash it onto us and it would run or um, even uh, yeah, run it in or maybe commonly you still commonly use today in aircraft systems in aircraft flight controls and in uh, other uh, critical systems where the environment and the the operating system have to be completely minimal and entirely reliable um, also used commonly in, in real-time systems, again, for flight controls and such. Um, the more recent things, people have created uh, what I call a compact Linux, which is um, a single-purpose Linux, which is built for a, a, a particular environment. Um, a generic one is BusyBox, which is, is kind of a, a solo binary that has everything built in. Um, Android by Google is uh, uh, specifically designed for uh, phone operating systems, so it's not quite as reliable as aircraft, but it is a tightly controlled environment because they have security concerns um, and to some degree stability is concerned. Uh, Chrome OS is a third one. It's designed specifically to run Linux for running a browser on very lightweight hardware. Those are the precursors to what I'm calling a container host. Um, None of those are, are fairly difficult to program for. They require rebuilds um, to add applications. They tend to be completely read-only uh, with very small limitations. The first of what I'm calling a container host is, is con uh, Container Linux or CoreOS um, is only about three years old or four years old. It was introduced in October uh, 2013. Uh, Project Atomic came along about uh, six months later. Project Atomic is a an additional. Uh, uh, it's a different way of approaching this problem. Um, Rancher OS was also a 2014. Uh, I can't speak much to Rancher OS. I haven't used it much, but it's, uh, from what I understand, in the same uh, kind of class of things. Um, the characteristic container hosts have some specific characteristics, and I'm I'm looking at bullets here, so I'm just going to run down them, but. Um, 
the important things are that it's minimal. You can do atomic uh, for roll forward and reliable rollback. Um, they do have writable space, but it's not the slash user space that's actually read only on uh, most container hosts. Um, they're meant to have conf minimal configuration because they're not actually designed to have users log in. Unlike previous uh, uh, services, you do have a login, but it's not meant to have particular users. Uh, the, the users should access it through other means than just logging on and getting a shell. Um, they're designed to be clustered. Um, whether this means an integrated uh, clustering mechanism or some, there, there's some built-in way of uh, forming clusters and sharing resources. Um, they have an integrated software-defined network so that those resources can communicate with each other within the cluster without exposing their traffic to the outside. And one of the key features is that uh, they actually have an integrated container runtime, and they're intended to run containers uh, at scale. Now, the individual hosts are still individual hosts, but using the clustering and, and networking, um, you can build applications out of individual containers. Um, we'll talk about what the what it means, uh, what a container runtime means in a minute. Um, the two I'm talking about have very different architectures even though they have similar uh, similar goals. Um, Container Linux uh, CoreOS is based on Chrome OS. It's designed to be embedded or, or frozen in the system. Um, it builds from source every time, so you get a clean build, but it means you have to build from source every time. Um, I'll show how this works in a minute, but it, it does the updates by uh, having a read-only user partition and then uh, overwriting the, the new version and swapping to it. Um, this is a, a diagram of the, the runtime architecture of container Linux. Um, as you can see, the you know, Etsy var and user are in regular writable space, but the, the excuse me, Etsy var and slash are in regular user space, regular writable space. The user partition, you only have one user partition active at a time. Um, and that's a read-only partition with all of your software, all of your libraries. Uh, and when uh, when you go to do an update, you download a new copy of the image, you place it into another uh, partition, and then you reboot into that new one. And what that means is that you uh, it does require a reboot to update, so you've got to have applications that can tolerate that. Um, hopefully that are spread out over many systems so that you can reboot a single instance. Um, but it also means that you can reboot directly back to the previous working version if there's a problem. Uh, the tools that CoreOS uses are something called Update Engine and Locksmithy. What Update Engine does is it checks for updates, pulls them down, and initiates a reboot. And what Locksmithy does is it uh, it forms a cluster and it locks uh, it gr grabs a mut uh, mutual exclusion lock when it goes to do an update so that you don't get a, a wave or you don't get a, a, a lot of simultaneous reboots. You get instead a, a roll. Systems fail in any way after the reboot. It's fairly trivial to boot back to the old version. Um, the Atomic Host is the second one and the one I know most about. Um, and it, it turns out the one that has the most tools in the area I'm talking about um, for, for sysadmins to manage them. The Atomic Host is based on RPMs. It, uh, it uses a thing called RPM OS tree, which is, um, it's a more complex management system than, uh, than CoreOS uh, swapping images. But it provides some some very valuable controls uh, that a simpler mechanism doesn't. Um, OS tree is integrated right at the bootloader, so when you uh, the, the Grub2 bootloader can recognize that it's booting an OS tree, and uh, and manages that properly. The the code is upstreamed and maintained, so this isn't something you have to worry about a a custom uh, Grub2. Instead of merely mounting. Uh, slash user uh, back and forth, it uses a, a more complex uh, set of layerings. It uses LVM, UDEV, and Mapper to provide all the maps uh, effectively 
hiding uh, the complexity from the from the users and the operators. Um, the swapping patterns are well known, though, so that uh, while those things are hidden, they're not really magic. They're they're very well known techniques um, that are used in other places as well. Um, one of the characteristics of uh, the atomic host is that rather than downloading a whole whole image, it only downloads the diffs, and I'll show you how that works here. Um, on an atomic host, again, you've got Etsy and VAR, which are read and write, and you've got a real user partition tree called OS tree objects, which is in the center of the diagram. Um, that contains all of the files that are actually used by the system. And then the two user partitions use hard links to the elements of that hashed uh, data structure. And where they're the same, if you look at the, the bin bash from both sides, you'll see that they link to the same hashed object. Um, and so when those two versions use the same object, they actually use the same object, and there's only one copy there. Um, and a, a, again, for the directory, if you look at the hash2, the third element, um, as long as both are using the same thing, um, there's only one actual copy of the of the target. In the case, if you look at the second line in both the user zero and user one, um, you can see that the hashes are different. In that case, uh, each one uses its own version of, of VI, um, and so there are two copies of it, and each one is linked correctly to it. And if you look at the last line, what you see is that when you do an update, and a specific hash is no longer referenced. Neither version of the neither bootable version references that file. Then um, RPM OS tree removes those files, and so you're never keeping multiple copies. And as much as possible, the the elements are are reused. Um, that covers uh, the the. Um, the operating system itself. Um, I don't know if Diane, if we have any questions at this point, but uh, if I don't hear, I'm going to keep going. Yeah, keep going. If we, you're doing, you're doing good time-wise. Okay. Um, the next piece I wanted to talk about is clustering and network. I'm going to run down this. Also, so currently the clustering used by OpenShift and by uh, various other container clustering systems is called etcd. It's um, it's a key value store, kind of like LDAP and kind of like uh, uh, something like uh, Sleepy Cat BSD, um, but it, it's networked and it's clustered. And um, it doesn't use, unlike other databases, it has a, a fairly high latency, so you can't easily use it um, in the same way that you would for, for messaging, although some of that is done. Um, but the goal really is fast reads and and uh, and good consistency. Um, the etcd itself is just a database. It's just a clustered database, and it's actually the thing that forms the clusters in any of these. Um, when you see a, an OpenShift cluster or if you see a Kubernetes cluster, there really isn't a Kubernetes cluster. There's really an etcd cluster that Kubernetes or OpenShift are using uh, for their database. And uh, that's what forms their actual cluster. Uh, the second piece is the software-defined network. Um, there's a couple of those. Um, I detailed Flannel, which is an older, simpler, uh, flat networking system that CoreOS has created um, when they were just getting started. More recently, people have switched to, uh, to using uh, Calico or uh, one of the other slightly more modern um, software-defined networks, uh, containerized software-defined networks. Uh, the big benefit for something like Calico is uh, is isolation. You can build dynamically isolated networks where Flannel is a big flat network space. I walked down some of this for etcd, so I won't go into too much detail here. It's a key value store. Uh, you can communicate. You can communicate. There are tools for, for managing it. Um, but you don't have to use them. And in fact, um, when I go forward, uh, in a moment, I'll show you that you can actually tell the tool to tell you what curl commands it uses to, to get its answers. Um, 
One of the interesting things about etcd is that um, while it has a put get uh, mechanism that any kind of key value store is going to have, it also has a watch mechanism. And the watch mechanism is is kind of special because you can uh, you can tell a client to watch a particular key, and that watch will block until the key changes, and then it will the watch will hand you back the the new value. So you can use this for things like polling. Um, you can also do proper polling, uh, but you can use this for things like uh, like weights on changes and polling and queuing. Um, uh, Flannel specifically, it's a software-defined network. It was created by CoreOS. Um, it's still supported, although it's less and less the recommended SDN. Um, you can run it on a public or private network, and uh, Flannel encapsulates the traffic so that if you're running uh, with only a single interface, the traffic running between the container hosts on behalf of the containers um, is not directly exposed to the, the carrier. Um, again, orchestration systems are moving towards uh, uh, Calico or OpenStack Courier or other cloud-providing network to provide more isolation and control. Um, again, Calico is newer. Um, I haven't worked with it yet, so I don't have a lot of details with it, but I expect to update the, uh, the demonstrations that I have in, uh, in that Examples as well soon. Um, I do want to cover something. That it's going to be a little of a of a of a sidestep um, because one of the things I've found is that people have a series of misconceptions about what containers are that um, sometimes incorrectly inform how they use them. Um, just so people are know, the the key word in the first four lines here is the word just. A lot of people will say containers are just to root or jails. They're not just that. There's significantly more to them and they shouldn't be dismissed. They're not just Solaris containers. Yes, there's a history there, um, but there are significant differences. It's not just LXC. LXC is uh, a precursor to, to Docker and to other container systems that essentially was kind of like an erector set for containers. You could build containers, um, but you had to be really dedicated and you had to really know how you were doing it. Um, one of the, probably the biggest advantage Docker brought when it came was that it removed this kind of erector set mentality and made it possible for people to worry more about the software inside than the construction. Um, I've heard people say that, that Containers are just another another packaging format. There's a repo out there. It's just software. We know how to do that. Why is what's the big deal? Um, I'll show in a little bit why Docker containers or where, where uh, that that container images are not just packaging. Um, one really important thing is it's not it's the containers are not going to replace VMs. Uh, there are software that are well suited to containerization, and then there's some that's really not. And VMs will continue to have a place. Um, another, the flip side of that is it's really important over time not to just try to stuff the contents of a VM into a container. It can be done. People are doing it now. They're doing it successfully and profitably. Um, but I suspect they're going to find fairly quickly that they're not really getting the advantages of containers that they're looking for. And finally, containers aren't just Docker. Uh, Docker was the first uh, well, the first container system that made it possible for uh, typical people to create containers and, again, to, to focus on the contents and behavior and not on the construction of the container itself. Um, but there have been several, several follow-ons. Rocket is one that I'm particularly uh, intrigued by, um, but Rocket has also uh, been taken over, or excuse me, a, a number of people have gotten together to form the, the uh, Open Container Initiative, which is seeking to define standards for containers, both for the, the runtime and the images, um, that make it possible for other container runtimes to, to use those images um, and to provide different sets of characteristics. So if those are the things a container is not, you know, what is a container? And I think people confuse three things about containers. They can they confuse the container instance, which is execution, um, the container the, the image, which is a software package plus some stuff, 
and the container runtime, which is software management. They may they may also con confuse the container image repository, although that's less uh, less common. Um, just to run down, what a container is, is, is not a virtual machine. It's not even, a container is really a, a not a great term. Um, what it is, is a process with blinders on. Um, uh, a fairly new set of techniques called kernel namespaces. And by new, I mean with the last four or five years. Um, kernel namespaces allow a process to see the host system differently from other hosts. And what a namespace does is it provides this new view um, containers run in a set of kernel namespaces so that when they make queries of the operating system, they see a different view from what the system uh, sees. Uh, the limitations, the, the processes can be limited by uh, kernel capabilities, which are also a, a, a relatively new addition to the, to the Linux kernel, again, in the last four or five years in, in internet times, so it's not all that long. Um, or it's a long time, depending on your view. Um, capabilities allow very fine grain uh, control of what a process is allowed to do when it accesses the kernel. Um, NSE Linux, which allows uh, labeling and control of access of, of file resources and process resources. A container image is again, more than, than a, a package, because while it does contain the base binaries and some scripting languages that an ordinary package would have, it also has code, uh, which allows the container to start uh, a version of itself. And if you download your typical Apache uh, package, whether a Debian or RPM, there is configuration there, but it stops as a static thing. You install the files and then you stop, and it's up to the user to figure out how to run that. Um, and there may be some scripts in there for for startup, but they're not um, they're not specific. Um, so the second piece that a container has that no uh, traditional package has is some metadata, which allows you to say how should this thing be run? What are the uh, what are the variables that are unresolved? Um, it also contains um, a security hash or can contain a security hash, so that you can be sure that the contents are unmodified, and a signature so that you know that it came from the source uh, that claims uh, to have created it. And the link at the bottom is the uh, the link to the OCI image specification. Um, and that was version one was released, I think in October, maybe late September, early October. So we now have an official version one of what does a container image look like. Um, and we have something that the various uh, runtimes can converge on so that we can uh, exchange containers between runtimes and expect them to work uh, in, in predictable ways. Um, so the container runtime is the environment in which something works. So it's, it's more what it does than what it is. Um, the container runtime is the piece on the operating system that takes an image and it takes some other information, and it initializes the environment in which that container will run, in which the, the, the runtime will happen. Um, it creates the namespaces so that it creates the views the process will see. It unpacks the image layers into a space, uh, into a file space, and makes that available as a unit. It can remount, mount remote file, service, uh, file systems, um, on behalf of the container when it's going to run. Um, and there's a the, the gap that the container runtime fills between the parts that the, the container image creator uh, finishes and the, the consumer wants to use. Um, it fills that gap and establishes that space, uh, file systems, and other environments. It sets or removes kernel capabilities. Um, it, creates that initial process, just like a, an ordinary process fork. Um, there's another set of steps which initializes the, the namespace, um, but it initializes that first process. And then it runs the command, finally, that, uh, that the user wants the container to run. Um, in addition, the container runtime provides some, some access stuff. And here I use the, the Docker examples, but um, there are examples in pretty much any runtime where 
you can run a command which will execute an additional process within that set of namespaces so that you can do debugging. Um, and you can take a look at the running container so that you can find out what IP addresses it has, what resources it's using, how it's connected to others. Um, and again, the, the link at the bottom is the link to the, the runtime specification from the OCI. Um, oops, went the wrong way that time. Um, so now we've, I've, I've gone through what the containers are and covered some background. Um, and now I'm actually getting to the piece that matters. Uh, and, and maybe it's been a long time coming. We've got the container hosts, we've got the container runtime, and we've got system administrators who have to make this stuff work. Um, everybody tends to focus on the, the containers or on the, uh, the visible pieces, the orchestration, but um, uh, uh, there are still tools that you need to use because you no longer have the tools on these container hosts that you're used to having. Um, so the container host comes with minimal tools. All it's meant to do is boot and attach to a network. Um, and so when it boots, it needs to know who it is. It needs to know how to reach other systems um, with an IP address and, and some routing information. It needs to have time sync. It's really, really critical that these have time sync because many of the operations they do use are time critical. Um, and they need to have some kind of authentication mechanism to allow somebody in from the outside. Uh, traditionally, that's uh, an implanted SSH key uh, for your admin user, uh, a system like LDAP or uh, LDAP authentication or Kerberos or um, even possibly, I, I don't know if it's done yet, that an OAuth uh, mechanisms like Google or, or, or GitHub. So if you've got these machines and the processes, the software you want isn't there, uh, what do you do? Well, you install your software as containers. Now they're going to be special containers um, because if, you know, as it says, you know, you would run a container, they have blinders on, you can't see the system. Well, it turns out the containers, because they're processes and namespaces, all processes on a container host and actually all processes on a conventional host now that has the capability of running namespaces, those are running in the system namespace. If you log on to your ordinary Linux box now, um, your process is running in the system namespace by default. Um, containers are running in their own namespaces. You can run containers in the system namespace. And it's important to remember uh, people think you're letting the container out. You're not really. You're letting the system into the container. Um, there are there are some cases where you can install additional stuff that I, I will go into in a minute. Um, there are several kinds of special containers for doing this. Um, the first kind is a, what's called a super privileged container. And if you look at the, the Docker run back here, um, it spends a lot of time um, punching holes. If you see the minus E host equals slash host uh, and, uh, and the IPC equals host, net equals host, and PID equals host, and it's running privileged. What those three things do is it says uh, the inner process communications, um, uh, memory management and such, are that the, the namespace to use is the host namespace. The network namespace to use is the host network namespace. So this container will inherit the the network uh, the network interfaces that the host has. The PID namespace is the same as the host namespace. So this this container will be able to see all of the processes that are running on the host as if they were running in the container. Um, and you can see it mounts the system var run var log. Um, and, and several other paths um, into the container. And what that does is it makes it so that the process running in the container has access uh, to all those resources. Um, and there are specific containers uh, built to do this so that you can uh, put the tools you want inside. Um, specifically, there's a, it was a, a container image called Fedora Tools that is used by both CoreOS and Atomic um, that has uh, you know, Traceroute and, and various other network tools, IP, 
um, pieces that you need to do system administration. Um, now, you're installing this as a container, but it's really meant for only running individual commands. You log in, you get a shell, you run your commands, you exit, and uh, the container processes have gone away. The image is still there, you can reuse it or you can delete it. But what that the super privileged containers allow you to do is run individual commands as a system administrator to examine the system, examine the, 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 the state of the system and the processes running using tools that aren't normally embedded. There's a second special container, which um, it, it's, they're just getting started, I think, in my opinion, and they're still working their way up. This is called a system container. Um, what a system container does that a super privileged container doesn't is a system container can run system services on the host in a way as if you had uh, installed the, the, the container um, instead of running for, this is really common for, um, for network services. If you wanted to run uh, a, a DNS name server, you probably don't want to run that in a container by itself. You want to run it using the system. You want people to, to query the whole system. So you can run uh, your, your name services. You can run an LDAP authentication service. Uh, you can run NTP so that uh, it's available to other things. But to run it as a system service, you want it to start when the system starts. You want it to, to, to boot up um, as part of the system boot up. And so these containers have um, some special metadata that's outlined in the in the links there. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but they're they're specifically designed to run as system services. Um, you note the first bullet says it's not dependent on Docker D. Um, these are startup. These start up using Run C or System D um, so that they can run before the Docker D is started because the Docker D depends on some net, local networking that may not be established yet. Um, there are some special commands that it can be used to install these. They're, they can be done with ordinary Docker commands or with ordinary container commands, but uh, there is, there's a pattern that's emerged. So um, the Atomic CLI was created to, to manage those. Um, as an example of one of these, uh, there's a system container called Cockpit. And Cockpit is, uh, it's a very neat web-based um, system monitoring tool. It runs as a process on the box. It's very small, um, but it offers a web interface and an API interface for interacting with the with the system. It uses the system authentication to to grant control. Um, I only have it here just to to go take a look at it. Um, it it's an example of something that you could run in every container host to give you some um, some visibility into the system that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, Dan, is are there any questions yet? I was, I'm going very fast. Um, no, I think we're we're both pretty we're pretty happy here um, right now. This is really um, shedding a lot of light on a lot of terms that we've all bandied about and um, haven't always had the depth. So this is great. Okay, um, I'm nearly at the end. The something that's that's very new then. Um, is the Fedora Modularity Project, uh, and they have an actual bootable image of their own called Boltron, which is not like either of the two that I've described, but it's it's intended to be a true container host in the sense that it really uses nothing else. And they're they're not using container, they're creating, creating a, a third kind of system container uh, characteristic that they're calling a module. And in the in the modularity model, uh, you can build up any kind of host that we would normally use using these modules and containers. Um, and it, it really, you can even use it for things like desktops. They're talking about the idea of a containerized desktop where uh, non-graphical services would use a module um, for shells and for shell tools. Um, and there's a graphical version called a flat pack. Uh, there are already several applications. I know uh, Maureen Duffy uses uh, Inkscape as a flat pack, which is a graphical containerized uh, uh, version of, of Inkscape that uh, has no dependencies on the underlying operating system. So you don't get any kind of conflicts if it needs a, a shared library or something that 
that the, hasn't been installed by the ops team, um, all of that's self-contained and you can update completely independently of the operating system underneath. Um, there are a set of uh, modules. Uh, you can, I provided the links for um, the modularity project in Voltron and for the set of modularity containers that have been created so far. Um, the goal of, of modularity is, um, is very ambitious. Uh, the idea is to completely decouple the OS and the app update schedules so that you can do you know, something that approaches continuous OS update. Every time there's a change, instead of waiting for a new distribution to be composed, if you make a change to the underlying operating system, you grab that change and you use it, and you are confident that it will not have detrimental effects on the applications you already have and are running. And the same goes for your, your applications. When you need to upgrade one, you just update it and uh, all of your applications are no longer coupled to each other. Um, you no longer get conflicting shared libraries uh, or, or situations like that that make it difficult um, to maintain the applications you want. This is very young. It's very experimental. Uh, they're really, I'm not even sure if they would call themselves beta yet. Um, and it's not something that I've had the time to try, but I definitely want to try it out and see. And regardless, I think, of whether modularity and Voltron themselves become widely adopted, I think they're going to start uh, they're going to start establishing patterns that others are going to adopt. Um, so I, I suspect this is going to be influential whether it whether it takes off or not. Um, we got to the CLI tools. I talked about the different containers, but uh, I haven't actually talked about the tools themselves. On container Linux, there really is only one tool. It's called Toolbox. And what Toolbox does is it actually downloads a, a copy of Fedora Latest. Uh, and you can install packages inside it because it looks like an operating system and you can, can delete them when you're done. But that's about as far as CoreOS goes in assisting the the administrator in managing the host. Um, they really are concentrating on, on both ends and their model really is uh, build the box, install Kubernetes, go. Don't, don't do anything else. Um, so you can install a trace route inside it, and then because it's in the in the system name space, you can you can manage it. Um, Atomic has noticed a bunch of patterns in creating containers uh, or creating these tools. Uh, they notice those patterns where you would say, "I want to start a container with trace route in it, but I want to use all of these system namespaces." And so they created the Atomic command originally just as a, a just as a shortcut for some of those uh, long container invocations because they noticed that there was constant pattern. Over time, they realized that there were a whole lot of uh, kind of logical operations that they wanted to be able to do that were related to uh, how container hosts work, and they've gradually incorporated a bunch of them in. Um, now these are just a set of samples of the things you can do with the Atomic CLI. Um, again, I provided the links for it. Uh, Atomic CLI is available. You don't even need to run it on an Atomic host or on a container host. You can actually install the Atomic to run services. Uh, I, and our client, I know you want on kind of the Raspberry Pi stuff. I haven't seen a port of the Atomic CLI to CoreOS yet, but I would love to see that just to to keep the playing field even. Um, what they did discover was that there were two sets of, uh, of operations that people wanted to do. Um, as you can see from these, you can see the atomic install and run. That's kind of what I was showing by the, the Docker install of a system container. And then atomic run would be uh, the, the runtime invocation of that service. Um, the bottom two are uh, had been used. Uh, I have another meeting coming, and no one needs to see that. Should have turned that off. In any case, um, the atomic host commands are uh, are system maintenance rather than creating individual uh, individual processes. The atomic host commands 
the upgrade and rollback and status of the um, of the running system. And um, again, it's kind of a wrapper for RPM OS tree. Most of those commands can be done directly as RPM OS tree commands, but they found over time that there was a pattern to how they were doing it and that uh, the pattern could be encapsulated. Um, so when you're working on a system with Atomic and especially on the, uh, on the Atomic, uh, the project Atomic hosts, um, the Atomic CLI is kind of your go-to command for management of the system. Um, again, I think this part is probably obvious to people. One thing to be aware of is you can, you can deploy these pretty much anywhere you would deploy an ordinary host. Um, you can pixie boot them. Uh, you can boot them in cloud providers. You can configure with cloud init. Um, there are images for CoreOS in all of the major um, commercial cloud providers. I haven't yet seen um, Atomic Host whether it's uh, Fedora, CoreOS, or RHEL um, offered as standard containers from the vendor um, in, the, in those areas. But it's simple enough to upload a, a single image, um, boot your machines from it, and then roll it forward from your cloud. Um, you can also load them in a personal VM through Vagrant. Um, and I've got uh, the links I have uh, provide a couple of different examples, one for CoreOS and one for Atomic. Um, customizing, you can customize container Linux, again, because it's based on Chromium and Chrome OS. You can download the tools and rebuild it. Um, when you do that, there's a couple of different, uh, you can build the image, and then there's a couple of different ways to turn them into um, development or production images, which have slightly different characteristics. Um, the production images will have a signature that, that the development ones won't. Um, currently, building requires a manual patch, and I've, I've listed the, the pull request um, to do that. It's fairly straightforward um, to apply that, but it hasn't been applied upstream. Customizing Atomic, o Atomic Host is, um, is more complex because you're managing not just the image, but a whole tree, and there's actually two steps to it. You're creating an OS tree, which is very like a GitHub repo, where you can do commits um, it's actually much more like a GitHub repo, even than even than an RPM repo. Um, and there's a set of operations on the the OS tree repo that are really out of scope for this. But um, if you're going to be doing customizations, you really need to to look into the build process and then the maintenance process. And those will be detailed in other places. Um, if you're updating CoreOS, uh, again the Update engine and locksmith control that, and it just downloads a new copy of the image, places it in the unused user space, and then uh, and then reboots. If you're updating Atomic, we've already already looked at this briefly. You can do a Atomic host upgrade, and it will tell you what RPMs it's updating, what differences there are between your current version and your new one. Um, you reboot to go to the new one once you've done the upgrade. If you're unhappy, you do an Atomic host rollback and then reboot and each of those operations it will tell you which packages are are changing um, just to wrap up um you know container hosts are good for container orchestration that's what they're designed for they're small single purpose uh single service hosts um they're uh, fairly small. The, the CoreOS image is about 200 meg, and the Atomic image is currently around 400. Um, the trade-off there is that the, the CoreOS image, you have to download that 200 meg every single time you update, where with the Atomic one, you, you load the entire image onto the box, and then your updates are going to be much smaller. Um, so your, your long-term net traffic is going to be much, much smaller with the Atomic uh, than it would be with CoreOS. Um, they're not so great for complex and monolithic apps, and that's that's true of containers in general. You really want to decompose the, your applications so that they fit into containers. It does mean that sysadmins need to adapt, and developers need to adapt. Um, people need to start building system containers, um, and then you need to plan how you're going to do updates and then automate and then let the automation do its job. Um, so that's what I've got for today. Um, 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Diane, for the opportunity to talk. Uh, that was a bit of a whirlwind, but I hope uh, there was something there for everybody. Um, well, there, def there definitely was, Mark. I, I think that the in interesting thing um, was it gave us a really good, for, for the first time for me, it really clarified the difference between CoreOS and Atomic in a real succinct way. So thank you very much for that, plus all the talk about the tools. Um, and and it, you are opinionated, and I love that about you. Um, <laughs> also, really good because most of the time when we when when I interact with folks, I'm interacting with developers who want just the most simplest tools. And so to get the sort of the sysadmin point of view on container hosts is really very helpful to understand. You know, once you know, once it's day two, as we were talking about before, and you really have to start maintaining and using all of this. Um, this is kind of, um, it, was real, it was really good um, for that, me. That's really the gap I'm trying to fill because it seems like people do rush straight to the, the shiny objects. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while I have an opinion, I, I'm perfectly happy to be swayed if people have uh, have other oh. opinions or have, have other, uh, other pieces. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it's very useful. Um, and really, I think, gave us the, the underpinnings of, of what I started out saying at the beginning of this. It's the underpinnings of what's running um, all, all of our wonderful microservices and cloud native apps. So, uh, I ended up using great. the full hour, huh? <laughs> no, I ended up using the full hour. I knew you would. You know, that's why I said do it in a half an hour. I knew you, I know you. You'd take an hour no matter what I, I said. I really tried. I know you did. But I can also, I'm going to make a joke about this because you could tell you're a uh, sysadmin type because you don't use any um, cute little animals other than the canoe at the beginning. And um, you're using a font that's like Times Roman. It, you could just absolutely, it's, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so I'm, I, I use the default. I, 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 I'm, I'm an Emacs guy. <laughs> you call my drawings so, retro because I, I was using, God, I never remember the name of it was, uh, Daya at one <laughs> point. I still like Daya. It's all good. Um, so thank you very much for doing this. I think we're going to end up having some follow-ons on this um, topic, but I wanted to get it out there. And so thank you very much for taking the time today. And those of you who listened in, thank you for um, your your patience and your questions, um, which I think you answered all of them in the talk as soon as you started um, going. So um, uh, we'll do this again very soon. So thanks again, Mark. Thanks again, Diane.